Don't you be in such a hurry Cause it only leads to worry There's a time to work But there's a time to pray Try to find a quiet place To hear His voice and seek His face Can you hear the Spirit calling Come away This is why you should come to SALT. To study the Bible like you have never studied before. To build your character. To make lasting friendships. To transform your life. Give up your year for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Just look at the times that we're living in. God is searching for an army of young people to take the gospel to the whole world. Will you be part of that army today? Hi everyone. I'd like to invite you to our daily AOI United prayer from 6.15 a.m to 6.55 a.m. for the Chinese session and 7 a.m. to 7.40 a.m. for the English session at Malaysian time. We have come to serious times which calls for serious prayers. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. We acknowledge that we need the Holy Spirit and this can be made a reality through United Prayer. God will do things for us when we pray that He will not do if we do not pray. We must all learn the power of prayer. Great things will happen in and among God's people and throughout the world if His people will come unitedly to pray. In our daily united prayer, we will pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit together. So come and join us in our daily united prayer, the most sacred and blessed time of the day. See you there!
fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. There is need of a broader scope, a higher aim. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than the preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. How often have we lost sight of eternity? Jesus has a message for you and me in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? One of our greatest needs today is of schools Schools that will train and equip people to serve God in whatever position or job they are called to serve in, to finish the work of preaching the gospel to the whole world. And this is what I eat, the Institute of East Asia Training, is all about. The Institute of East Asia Training is a Bible school that's located in Perak, West Malaysia. It was established in the year 2016 by Eugene Pruitt. We now have our own land and our new school building is almost ready to be used. We offer a three-year Bible teacher training course where graduates will be fully equipped to serve God wherever He calls them. Here in Aid, students learn by hands-on experiences while studying without having to wait until they graduate to start doing things for God. Students are not only taught the duty of prayer, Bible study, and witnessing, but they are taught how to pray, how to study the Bible, and how to exercise faith and obedience through evangelism. We offer a scholarship program where students get to pay their fees through canvassing, going door to door and meeting people who otherwise would never hear the gospel because of either fear or prejudice. Through canvassing, the students learn valuable lessons on faith and dependence on God. They learn by experience what it means to pray without ceasing, and most importantly, lessons on self-denial. This is why the canvassing work is the best preparation for any other line of missionary labor. Students devote a portion of each day to active manual labor of which the benefits are endless. Physical labor develops in students habits of industry and productivity. It promotes a spirit of self-confidence, self-reliance in students while protecting them from many evil and sinful degrading habits which are so often the results of idleness. If it's your desire to study the Bible, to develop your character, to be trained and equipped so you could serve God wherever you are, Ait is a place for you. Come and join us. Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Rebecca and I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are, who are watching with us this morning. Um, this morning, our speaker is Pastor Justin Kim. Last week, he had talked about the law of looking. And this morning, he will be talking about the law of beholding. Uh, so before we start, let us begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Lord, I want to thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. We want to thank you for another day uh, in our life. And Father, as we begin our morning devotion, I want to pray that you please bless us with your Holy Spirit, especially uh, anoint Pastor Justin Kim, that he may speak your words and that you may speak to us through him. Thank you, Lord. Please be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Pastor Justin Kim, I pass the time to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, I hope you're all doing well. Hanying and Dazahao and happy Sabbath to, to all of you. I can't see uh, who's on, but I know there are many of you, <coughs> excuse me, all of you online on, uh, on social media and on Zoom. Um, last, as uh, our sister said last week, uh, I meant, I spoke on the topic of the law of looking, and we are under the theme of looking unto Jesus. Uh, this morning, I will be speaking on the law of beholding, the law of beholding. The two laws are exactly the same, uh, but they are different sides of, yeah, of a coin, if you will. And then tomorrow morning, I'll be look, I will be presenting on the law of liberty, the law of liberty. I have a PowerPoint presentation I'd like to um, share with all of you. Let's see here. And if you can see that, kind of give me a thumbs up or a smile. Great. Thank you for that. And I know we prayed, but I know... Um, the more we pray, the better. So if you can bow your heads just one more time, and for my sake, for the Lord to bless uh, this presentation, if you can if you can bow your heads and uh, pray with me, that would be appreciated. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you, you blessed um, in every presentation thus far. And Lord, we ask for um, your Holy Spirit to bless our minds, our hearts. We ask for the cleansing of the word um, and that your spirit may um, provide your justifying and your sanctifying power. We look forward to your um, glorifying power uh, for that future hope. But Father, as we um, convene here through digital means, we ask that you transcend this PowerPoint presentation into something where you speak to our hearts directly. Father, we ask for a very special blessing that we may be able to not only see Jesus, but also receive the power to become like Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the presentation called The Law of Beholding. Uh, last week, uh, we looked at the law of looking, and I mentioned this concept called WYSIWYG, uh, a concept in computer design back in the 1980s. Uh, we're not, the topic is not important. It's just that phrase is a wonderful phrase. And basically what you see is what you get. So if you spend hours watching uh, sports, uh, what will happen is you will actually become better at sports. There are many athletes who on their off time, they are instructed to watch the greats. And so just watching them, they learn how to, even on a subconscious level, to move their arms and move their hands in basketball, move their legs uh, in soccer, football, in, in whatever activity there is. Um, the more music videos you watch, you will become like the, the entertainers and the pop stars of the world. The more movies you watch, you pick up all the habits and the nuances of the actors. Whatever you watch is what you will become. And so last week, uh, the, the admonition was to be careful what you watch, be careful what you see. And not necessarily only the bad stuff, but also many things that are not bad at all. There's neutral things. And we got to ask ourselves, is this the best thing for us? So now no, it's, it's obvious, don't watch the bad stuff. Don't have the bad stuff in front of your eyes, but also this midline stuff, the gray stuff that may be amoral in nature? Is it worth your time? Is it worth your attention? So this is the law of looking. 
Um, I mentioned this quote before, and uh, as I mentioned before in my other presentation, I believe in the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. I believe it, it, it is one of the signs of the remnant church, and I believe in the inspiration of the writings of Ellen White. So I just use it a lot, uh, especially in these presentations. Um, and if you have any questions on that, you want to uh, ask your, your pastor or get a Bible study on the importance of the spirit of prophecy. I really do not um, advocate that it, these are just good writings. They are not. They are the best writings out there, second only to the inspiration of Scripture, the Old and New Testament. So I mentioned this uh, last time. Uh, it says, that to some, the Word of God is interesting. And uh, I mentioned about the taste of chocolate and the taste of orange juice. And a lot, many times, this is in incompatible just because of the artificial uh, sugars in chocolate will now allow you to appreciate the natural sugars of the orange. And uh, I liken this to the, the taste of, of the worldly entertainment and the taste of scripture. And you just have to, there is the washing of the word. Yeah, Ephesians 5. And what happens is you enter into, when you read the text, you have on your glasses, you kind of have like a lot of a lot of ideas or, or other stuff clogging your, your glasses. So as you read the word, it cleanses the lenses once, allowing you to read the Bible even clearer. But, 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 but you reading the Bible cleanses your lenses again and allows you, and it's, kind of, it's the cycle that allows you to appreciate more of spiritual truth. But in the beginning, it's very hard if you're used to watching all these TikToks and all these other YouTube videos and um, all the social media out there. And so uh, if this becomes too much of a habit, uh, become you have no relish, I'm reading from the, the yellow part here, no relish for the reading of God's word or for religious exercises. I also mentioned here, we must turn away from a thousand topics that invite attention. There are matters that consume time and arouse inquiry. And this, this is what I meant about all these other topics that uh, may very well even be good. Uh, but we need to be focused and we need to set apart how we use our time and our attention, especially when it comes to visual and the media, the, the video uh, world. Uh, this is our theme, Hebrews 12, 2. Uh, undoubtedly, on the other speakers have spoken about looking unto Jesus. I did mention that uh, if you look at the Greek, the word for looking does not necessarily connote the English word of looking. If I ask you, hey, look over there, then you just look over there. And it's mainly a, in English, a, a passive uh, verb, um, has a kind of a passive connotation. Uh, but in the Greek, it's not. The Greek word is actually to stop looking at what you're looking at now, turn your focus onto this, and stare at it. Focus at it. It's a lot more intense in nature. Um, so it's not looking unto Jesus. It's more turn and stare at Jesus, and do not let go of Jesus with your eyes. Uh, how much more colorful uh, is the original language. And this is kind of the basis of where I get the law of beholding. Uh, the law, you may think, you know, beholding and looking is the same thing. And yeah, they, they are in the same verb. Um, the meaning is within the same family. Uh, but beholding is just a lot more intense. So the law of looking is we shouldn't be looking at the bad stuff. We shouldn't be even looking at the good stuff and all these other things that invite our intention but we need to behold the best thing, and that is the Lord Jesus. Now, this may seem very elementary. This may seem uh, very cliche. Uh, you probably have heard uh, many sermons regard regarding this. I have, and I wanted to get a little bit more practical. And when people say, behold Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, I mean, I'd be sitting there in sermons, and I'd be asking myself, okay, well, behold the Lamb of God. Well, how do I do that? What does that look like? How do I use my time? To behold God, behold Jesus. And this is what this presentation is, is about, the law of beholding. So these are the two um, laws. Uh, there are the same thing, but on, on flip signs, one, uh, looking at Jesus is a little different than beholding Jesus. And I want to emphasize the difference between the two. So for the Christian, what should we be beholding? Yes, last, the last presentation was what we shouldn't be looking at. 
But here we go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I know you are very familiar with this verse. The Bible says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. It's very uh, important that uh, this passage is talking about the mental culture, the mind culture, your, your visual diet, your audio diet. What is it that you put into your brain, into your mind, and essentially into your heart, into your inner being? Uh, and especially in this world of social media saturation, of every sort of media format there is out there, uh, we as Christians, this is, this is our, our current challenge. We as Christians must uh, have a filter in the foremost of our minds, not in the back recesses of our minds, not something that's passive on the for forefront of being able to choose what we see on a conscious level. And Philippians 4, 8 is that, um, is that are the principles of that test of which we filter. Um, she says, uh, the Bible says, he says, uh, Paul says here, think on these things and these things, and this is the way that these things enter into your mind. You learn them, you receive them, you hear them, you see them. Think about these things and then do them. And this is part of the sanctification process. Now, let's go a little bit deeper here. And Spirit of Prophecy actually um, gets a little bit more, more specific, specific detail. Uh, here we go to Bible Commentary, chapter, uh, volume 6. Our minds take the level of the things on which our thoughts dwell. If we think upon earthly things, we shall fail to take the impress of that which is heavenly. Temporal things are not to engage our whole attention or engross our minds until our thoughts are entirely of the earth and of the earthly. Now you understand the balance here is there are some earthly things that we have to be mindful of, right? You need to take a shower. You need to go make, make, um, make bread. You got to cook. You got to go to the bathroom. There are these normal things that, that, that you need to take care of. But she says here, these things are not to engage our whole attention or engross our whole minds. So there are these things of, of entertainment or sports or comedy or whatever entertainment format there is out there that some people get obsessed with. And if you're not careful, these things become a part of you. I mean, she says, she continues here. We are to train, discipline, educate the mind so that we may think in a heavenly channel and that we may dwell on things unseen and eternal, which will be discerned by spiritual vision. It is by seeing him who is invisible that we may obtain strength of mind and vigor of spirit. So she's definitely here saying, what is your mind focused upon? And we need to constantly create the habit of thinking about heavenly and spiritual and eternal things. Uh, and it's, and it's, there, there's some effort involved. This is, this is not the basis of your salvation. This is a basis of, of getting the mind of Christ in you. And it requires effort on your end. Now, fundamentally, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus is the one that saves us. So it is not through training and discipline and education that we become saved. It is because we are saved that now we use all of the powers that God has and the Holy Spirit he activates all these powers that we try to have that mind uh, to think of more of these eternal spiritual things. So the last line here, it says, it is by seeing him who is invisible question is how do we see him who is invisible what are we seeing uh we don't believe in these you know having pictures and and uh idols and and statues so how do we do this she says here continuing on now we're looking at the time element our daily and hourly work is set forth in the words of the apostle looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith our theme of of, of army of youth this year but the, 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 uh, the cadence of which this is to occur is daily and even hourly. Uh, and, and so don't, don't get too mechanical in understanding this. That does not mean you set your watch and every hour, dee, 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 and I got to think about Jesus. Dee, 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 think about, no, no, no. She's just saying this should be a natural habit that occurs all throughout the day, every single day.
Now, how does this work? So if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 14. And this is this this story really illustrates how uh, this this um, this portion of sanctification occurs in Matthew chapter 14, verse 25, Matthew 14, 25. I have it here. But if you have your Bibles, you can also turn to it. The Bible says. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30. But... And here's where the story changes. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now, you're, you're most likely you're very familiar with this, uh, with this story. Um, and, and everyone says, keep your eyes on Jesus. I always was scratching my head. How do we keep, how do I keep my eyes on Jesus? So when you give your life to God and you're now following him, um, the more, and we'll cover some other quotes that talk about this, that, that the more I see Jesus, the more I study the Bible, I see Jesus. The more I read the spirit of prophecy, I see Jesus. I see his character the more through prayer. I speak to him. He speaks to me. I feel the impressions of the Holy Spirit in different decisions of my life. Then you get you see Jesus. Then there's there's going to be a point where where uh, you see an imperfection inside you. you. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's a sinful habit. Maybe it's some form of selfishness. I don't know. Whatever it is, the temptation then is to look upon that sin. And to focus on that sin and to with all of your strength and all of your might to to think that sin out. And many people and many, I would say many even conservative Christians, conservative Adventists, uh, they are so not Jesus focused, but they're actually very sin focused. They're trying to they're focused on the sin to get it out of their lives. So they do everything possible to 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 cut that out of their lives. Um, and, and what happens? And, and I want to I want to ask you to do this. OK, uh, close your eyes and think and, and do not think. Um, and when I say I'll give you one, two, three and you do it. Do not think of a purple elephant with wings. OK, do not think of it for the next three seconds. OK, well, I'll, I'll do one, two, three. And for three seconds, do not think of a purple elephant <laughs> with wings. Ready? One, two, three, go. Don't think it. Don't think it. Don't think it. Stop. Now, how many of you did you think of a purple elephant? Um, some of you, and I've done this before, you know, it's, it's just human nature. The more you try not to do something, the more you get focused on it. Now, some of you are very smart and you're like, well, I thought of a, a green snake with a hat instead. Okay. Well, that's the whole point. We need to be thinking of Jesus more then even our performance, our behavior, our downfall, even if you sinned, if you six times, the seventh time, get back up again and focus on the mercy, the forgiveness, the grace, the power, the overcoming word that Jesus gives us to focus on Jesus more than even yourself. I mean, that when, when I realized that that was, that was a huge revelation to me, just like here in this story in Matthew 14. Here, Peter had his eyes on Jesus, and as long as he had his eyes on Jesus, even though the water is just not stable for him, as long as he had his eyes on Jesus, he was going forward. But the minute he saw the wind boisterous, it's very interesting that even Spirit of Prophecy says that he, Peter actually looked back to see how, what the other disciples were doing. Okay, so I don't know what's, what's going on there. Maybe there's pride, maybe there's uh, and jealousy. <laughs> whatever crazy things are going through Paul's mind, uh, Peter's mind, then he keeps his eyes off of Jesus. And those at that moment focuses on himself. Boom. He starts sinking. Yeah. 
our eyes, even in the midst of sin, have to be even on, on Jesus all the more. And we depend on him on the justifying and the sanctifying grace that he gives us. Well, how does this work? We're going to keep him going. She says here, take God with you in every place. The reason why so many are left to themselves in places of temptation is because they do not set the Lord ever before them. Our chief danger is having the mind diverted from Christ. Okay. So this is about, this is the mental process, right? Mental process. It's being aware of God's presence. Um, I'm jumping ahead of God's presence. Oh, here we go. So number one, how do we do this? How do we do this? Number one is God's presence. Matthew 20, verse uh, 28, verse 20. You have the great commission there. And it says at the end, Jesus says, and lo, behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Okay, so his presence is with us, but how many of us are actually aware that as you are watching this screen, you're not watching me, I'm not in this office by myself, the Lord is with me, the Lord is with us through this Zoom, he's, he's, we are here in front of him, that awareness must be constant, that awareness must be habitual, that awareness must always be mindful of God's presence. As a shield from temptation and an inspiration to purity and truth, no other influence can equal the sense of God's presence. No other influence can equal the sense of God's presence. So here's the thing. If you are addicted to alcohol or coffee, caffeine, or, or K-pop, okay, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, whatever your addicted to lying or, you know, whatever. The more you focus on that, you may have temporary relief. You may have temporary victory, but it's not victory. Our focus must be on Jesus. Now, that sounds elementary, but the more we see Jesus, we'll see more of his majesty, the more of his awe, and to be aware of his presence. That focus on him, looking onto Jesus, that element will give us victory. Friends, brothers and sisters, I don't know how that works, but it does. That's the promise of scripture. And this is the thing that, that many, many, many Christians get, get uh, confused about. They say they receive Jesus and go, all right, now it's up to me to clean up my life. No, it's your job now to keep your eyes on Jesus and Jesus gives you the victory over all these sins and over all of sin. Yes. Let's keep going. Hebrews uh, 4, uh, chapter 4, said so that all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Somehow in the weirdness of sin, we think that when we're doing, we're watching Korean dramas, you know, seasons one through nine, episodes one through one million. We think we're the only ones watching it, that God doesn't know what I'm doing. I'm doing it in secret. But no. We need to be convincing our minds, hey, Jesus is watching you do this. Jesus is watching you waste your time. Jesus is watching you do all this frivolous stuff, okay? Jesus is watching you drink that alcohol. Jesus is watching you do all this, uh, taking all these drugs for whatever, whatever, whatever reason. So she says, she says here, uh, every hour of the day, every hour of the day, we should realize that the Lord is near, that he sees all that we do and hears every word we utter. And this is the real secret of Joseph's victory over a Mrs. Potiphar. And you guys know this here. Uh, I'm going to move my screen. That's okay. Uh, 39.9. There is none greater in this house than I. Remember, this is Joseph. This is when Mrs. Potiphar was uh, trying to seduce him. And he says that, um, I'm going to skip down here. But you, because you are his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So even though in the house, there was no one in the house except for Mrs. Potiphar and Mr. Joseph, he says, no, -uh -uh. God is still here and God watches, God sees. How can I do this? This was not a temporary understanding. This was a habit that he cultivated of God's presence always with him. The reality, the ontological reality is God is always with us. But somewhere in our dumb brains, we start thinking that there are times that God is with us and there are times when he's not. And when he's not, then I'm free to do what I want to do. And we end up doing all this foolishness. 
in following Christ, looking unto him who is the author and finisher of your faith, you will feel that you are working under his eye and that you are influenced by his presence and that he knows your motives. At every step, will you humbly inquire, will this please Jesus? Will it glorify God? Uh, one time I was, a, I was a pastor of a local church and I had the privilege to uh, be a gym teacher. Uh, gym in the United States is physical education. And uh, we, I had all the students. I was a pastor. They gave me a whistle. I love my whistle and I would blow it. And I would do all these sorts of things uh, and, and to uh, make exercise and, you know, jumping jacks and raise up cardio. And it was wonderful. It was, it was a great way to discipline children and make them do whatever I wanted them to do. Um, and there was this one child. Uh, this was, I believe, first grade, second grade, third grade. Uh, elementary school, one child was just the most disobedient child I've ever met. He'd go around, I mean, he'd be punching kids, he'd be kicking them in the shins, um, he would be pulling on girls' hair, he'd be catching balls and throwing at people's faces, and I'm always blowing my whistle and telling him to stop. Stop, stop. I'm yelling at him. I'm praying for him. I'm praying, Lord, cast this demon outside of this child every night. I was just, he did not make my job uh, pleasant. Well, one morning, uh, I'm, I'm teaching physical education. And this child is a perfect child. This child is nice, smiling, calm obedient, helping children up, not pulling on hair, not throwing balls. And I'm like, what has happened? I'm thinking, Lord, have you answered my prayer? This is just amazing. Like what this child is now converted. The Holy Spirit is resting upon him. But I kind of look closer at his, at what he was doing. And every couple of minutes, he would do something and then he'd look behind and keep on going, playing and running around. And he'd stop and he'd look behind again. He, always, he was always looking to the back of the gymnasium. And I was wondering, what is, what, what is he looking at? So I kind of followed his eye, long, eye line to the back of the gymnasium. And there, there was a curtain. And behind the curtain, right at the corner, I saw someone there. And it was his mother. <laughs> it was his mother. Somehow, his mother heard wind of how active this child was, and she came for the whole day that day, and she wanted to see uh, what her son was like, but he knew that his mother was there, and so he acted differently. Who we are in front of determines who our God is and how our behavior war or works in front of that God. Some, sometimes we start thinking that we are in, living in front of people and we act a certain way. Well, we, we live uh, for other people, and that's not, that's not biblical. Sometimes we think we don't live, there's no one around, it's just me. And we start living and for myself, and the self is God, and that is not biblical. We live before God. Our audience is God. And God is the one who we behave in front of, who we live in front of, who we act in front of. And we need to be asking ourselves at every moment, does this please Jesus? What would Jesus think if I do this? That, that habit of cultivating the presence of Jesus is step one in looking and beholding Jesus. Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith means the contemplation of Christ beholding Christ, ever cherishing the dear Savior as our very best and honored friend, so that we would not in any action grieve and offend him. The more we think about the character of Jesus, Jesus' gentleness, the way he spoke to sinners, we become changed. Just like the way we see bad things and we become bad, the more we see Jesus the more we become like Jesus. The way that uh, he forgave uh, the, the most evil of, of sinners, 
the most reviled in society. The more we stare at that, the more we study it, the more we memorize it, the more we meditate upon it, contemplate how Jesus could just uh, traverse social classes and gender and racial barriers, the more we will become like that. The more that we see the courage of Jesus, the more that we see the, the meekness of Jesus, the more that we see the love of Jesus, the more that we see the temperance, the self-control of Jesus, the more we will become like that. And so these are things to be contemplating, not just only the theory of Jesus and, and, and the personality, the, uh, the, how do I say it, the, the character personality of Jesus, but the actual embodiment of who he is. Have you ever uh, looked at the sun? Uh, I used to do this when I was little. And uh, I, I, I was told recently by my eye doctor friend not to do this. But you ever stare at the sun directly? And uh, if you stare for long enough, you start seeing like this, the sun starts turning different colors, like blue and, and then it's, it's swirling around like purple and, uh, uh, you know, all these different weird shapes and patterns and then if you turn then you start seeing this the the image of the sun wherever you go right it just kind of follows you wherever you go and that is essentially what happens in your devotional time every morning when you set apart the first thing that you do in the day that you burn your eyes on jesus and then wherever you go, you start seeing Jesus in other people and other elements around, you know, your life and your world and your circumstances. And this is a way that uh, that you you look upon Jesus. Now, Sister Wright actually uses this as a as a um, as a motif. Uh, I don't know if I can read this here. Forgive me. As the mind dwells upon Christ. The character is molded after the divine similitude. The thoughts are pervaded with a sense of his goodness, his love. We contemplate his character, and thus he is in all of our thoughts. His love encloses us. If we gaze even a moment upon the sun in its meridian glory, when we turn away our eyes, the image of the sun will appear in everything upon which we look. Thus it is when we behold Jesus... Everything, everything we look upon reflects his image, the son of righteousness. We cannot see anything else. We cannot talk of anything else. His image is imprinted upon the eye of the soul and affects every portion of our daily life, softening and subduing our whole nature. By beholding, we are conformed to the divine similitude, even the likeness of Christ. Isn't that just amazing? I think that's just an awesome, awesome quote. Just gives me a lot of hope and encouragement. Uh, I know that there are so many questions when it comes to sanctification, but it's a, it's a frankly very mysterious, but very easy concept. You keep your eyes on Jesus and God changes you. Second place where we look at God's glory, God's character is nature. Uh, we see this in uh, Psalms 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. I'm not going to read all that, but basically Psalms 19 says there are two places where you see God's glory, God's nature. One is nature, one is, one is nature and one is a scripture. Uh, this is a divine inspiration and natural inspiration. But we have to keep in mind, though, that because of sin, nature is, has been defaced so you still see remnants of God's glory. You see remnants of the image of Jesus, but uh, it has been damaged a bit. Uh, but this is another way where uh, we're not only contemplating of the stories of Jesus and the words of Jesus, but we go down in nature and we see the, the results of his creation handiwork in, in real time. I'm not going to go too much in that. It's a lot of this is self-evident, but this is the a second source. Of, of seeing Jesus. Number three, we talked about this right now, is, uh, is the Bible. John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. She says here, it's very clear. Beholding Christ means studying his life as given in his word. So from Genesis to Revelation, we need to be studying every verse. Every verse has been imprinted with Jesus, some 
aspect about Jesus. Even the weird passages, even the genealogies, even the difficult parts, in some way, uh, some verses are very obvious. Yes, uh, Galatians 2.20, boom, like that, you can just see Jesus there. There's some others that are a little bit more, it requires studying the, the prophecies, uh, 2300 day prophecy. It's not just about the timeline of what's going to happen on the earth, but it is a revelation of God's character. And then there's other elements that it requires a lot more time. And the more time and the more character reflection happens, the more deeper we can get scripture and more revelations emerge from the text. Bible is in is in crucial in, 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 in developing the sense of God's presence, not only for mental culture, but also for, for seeing Jesus in every single verse and, uh, and seeing what Jesus is saying to you through that verse. Let not imagine, oh, I can't see this, let not imagine that without earnest effort on their part, they can obtain the assurance of God's love. When the mind has been long permitted to dwell only on earthly things, it's a difficult matter to change the habits of thought. That which the eye sees and the ear hears too often attracts the attention and absorbs the interest. But if we would enter the city, if we would enter the city of God, and look upon Jesus in his glory, we must become accustomed to beholding him with the eye of faith here, here. So this is through Bible, through nature. Uh, we need to develop uh, uh, the habit of God's presence here on this earth. The words and the character of Christ should be often the subject of our thoughts and of our conversation. Each day, some time should be especially devoted to prayerful meditation upon these sacred themes. It's all about mind culture, diet for the mind. What you put in your mind is what you will become. So the more we see Jesus, the more we will become like Jesus. Fourth place where we see the, uh, the, the, the character and the glory of Jesus is in people is in people, okay? We see meekness. We see the fruits of the, the Holy Spirit. We see meekness, gentleness, joy, peace, long-suffering, self-control, all these elements. We see them in real time in people. I mean, this was the original purpose for humanity, to reflect God's character. This is what the first angel is calling us back to, to reveal, to reflect, to give glory to him, right? To be reflections of his character. But we have to keep in mind that, uh, that just like nature, okay, we have people, although people do reflect God's character, it's not one, it's not the best pure source, obviously, because we are, we are people. I'm going to go to this next one here, okay? She says here, let us turn away our eyes from beholding the imperfections of those who are in the church, but who have not the likeness of Christ. We shall not be held responsible because those who make a high profession do not possess corresponding virtues. Let us thank God that it is not our privilege, that it is our privilege to turn our, away our eyes from these defective Christians and look upon those who are truly devoted, who are doers of the word, and who in life and character bear the image of the divine. Above all things, thank God that it is your privilege to look upon Christ, the perfect pattern. Jesus is the perfect pattern. We see this also reflected in other disciples and other leaders and other godly men and women, but not all. But that shouldn't be a form, a point of discouragement. We shouldn't be critical. We shouldn't be pointing our fingers. That's just something that, that shouldn't even occupy your mind. This should be, this, this is the reality check of the world that we live in. So this is what happens. You discover Christ and what happens naturally when you see the holiness of Jesus and you see the wondrousness of Jesus, you just see, I mean, any story of Jesus is just amazing. Jesus is amazing. But naturally, when you see how amazing Jesus is, there'll be something that emerges in you. If you're honest with yourself, that the Holy Spirit brings out, um, I have a impatience and a temper problem, right? I have a hard time tolerating um, people who, who, I mean, I am a critical person, right? So then when I see Jesus 
And the more I meditate upon him, some of these negative things, my weaknesses, they kind of come up to the surface, right? So then the temptation is for me to stare at these negative things and like, man, I got to get rid of these things. I got to try harder. That is not the way, right? That is putting your eyes on these sins. No, our eyes must be on Jesus. So what happens? Then I got to confess these faults. Lord, I got this stuff. These things have emerged out. Please take them out of my life, right? And then you look at other, the opposite of these things uh, these, as virtues. So I have impatience. So I look at the stories where Jesus reveals his patience, where the patience of Jesus is the main virtue. And those are the, 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 the stories that I study, that I memorize, and I meditate, that I, I go a ruminate in my mind over and over and over and again. I'm trying to bite each verse, trying to get all the juice I can out of it. I'm trying to soak every verse in before I go to bed, while I'm driving, while I'm taking the shower, just in my mind, going over and over and over and over and over again. And I don't know how it happens. But through the Holy Spirit, through God's power, through the grace of God, naturally, the patience of God slowly gets woven into my life. Not by my strength, but by God's strength. It just happens. This happens not just for patients, but it happens for all these things. Self-control, it happens for, for people who have uh, who are too outs, outgoing. They need more meekness. There's people who are so shy. They need the courage of Jesus. All of us have to be in the image of Jesus's character at the same time maintaining our individuality. I think that's just a, an amazing thought. Amazing thought. We're all different, but we're all, we'll all be like Jesus. So, uh, when you, the more you see Jesus, the more the bad stuff pop up, the bad stuff pop up, you confess these and you say, Lord, help me to focus on, on, on you more and get these things out of my life. Okay. And we're looking at, this is the anatomy of, of how this happens. Each one will have a close struggle to overcome sin in his own cart. Okay. This is at times a very painful and discouraging work because as we see the deformities in our character, we should keep looking at them. When we look to Jesus and put on the robe of his righteousness. So the struggle, the struggle is not with the sin. The struggle is with the faith to keep your eyes on Jesus. Do you understand that? Some people emphasize the struggle with sin. But Jesus has already won the victory over sin. Our struggle is to keep our eyes on Jesus. And although that sounds a lot, it sounds a lot easier than it, than it is. To keep you, we don't, we naturally do not want to do that. But the, when you look to Jesus, and the, you know, this is the hymn, and what, what I'm going to close it, but I'll mention it now. You guys know this hymn. Turn your eyes, I don't know if this is in Chinese, I think it's in Chinese, uh, Mandarin. Uh, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his beautiful face, and the things of this earth will go strangely dim. I love that word, strangely. I don't know how it works. I mean, I know. I mean, it's, it's, it's God. It's the Holy Spirit. But the actual mechanics of it, I don't know. It's strange. But those things that I liked, strangely, I won't like anymore. Those things that I was addicted to, those things that I was, strangely, I will no longer be addicted to. I will no longer have in my life. Keep going. Uh, when one turns away from human imperfections to behold Jesus... Uh, divine transformation takes place in the character. The spirit of Christ working upon the heart conforms it to his image. Let it be your effort to lift up Jesus. Let the mind's eye be directed to the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. A divine transformation happens upon your character. Now, um, this, is, this is awesome. This is a long quote, but this is a very good one. It is the Holy Spirit, the comforter, which Jesus says he would send into the world that changes our character into the image of Christ. And when this is accomplished, we reflect as a mirror the glory of the Lord. That is, the character of one who thus beholds Jesus Christ is so like his. That one looking at him sees Christ's own character shining out as from a mirror, imperceptibly. And this is where a lot of Christians struggle. We don't see the change. The thing is, we're not supposed to see the change. But if we do this day by day, 
on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, you will look back one day and you will say, wow, I have come so far. You don't notice it today and you probably won't notice it tomorrow, but you look back and be like, wow, God is awesome. But just to make sure you don't get too proud, proud and prideful, then you look back at Jesus and you say, man, I still have way to go. But praise the Lord, I come this far. Now I have hope to keep going for eternity to become like Jesus. But the point is, it is imperceptible. You cannot see it. Imperceptibly to ourselves, we are changed day by day from our own ways and will, and will into the ways and will of Christ into the loveliness of his character. Thus, we grow up into Christ and unconsciously reflect his image. I should have underlined that next uh, adverb, unconsciously. We don't know how, what's going on, but it does happen. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Those who make room in their hearts for Jesus will realize his love. All who long to bear the likeness of the character of God shall be satisfied. The Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul who is looking unto Jesus. Man, that's just awesome. You got to, you guys got to write that down, cut it out and, and put it in a fortune cookie and then, and, and, and put it on your refrigerator. The Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul who is looking unto Jesus. Amen. When the sinner has a view of the matchless charms of Jesus, sin no longer looks attractive to him. For behold, the chiefest among 10,000, the one altogether lovely, he realizes by a personal experience the power of the gospel, whose vastness of design is equaled only by its preciousness of purpose. I love that phrase, the matchless charms. So when you really see Jesus, K-pop, K-drama is just going to look like, like the stupidest thing out there. When you really see the matchless charms of Jesus, the Olympics that are going on, it's going to look stupid. All the movies out there, it's just ridiculously dark stuff. All the things that you're addicted to is just going to look utterly stupid with all due respect to those things. But we are comparing what, what can the, how can the world compare to the matchless charms of Jesus? Uh, just a couple more quotes here. If we would permit our minds to dwell more upon Jesus Christ in the heavenly world, we should find a powerful stimulus and support in fighting the battles of the Lord. Pride and love of the world will lose their power as we contemplate the glories of that better land so soon to be our home. Beside the loveliness of Christ, all earthly attractions will seem of little worth. And so I conclude with this. I, I mentioned this before. Um, too bad we can't be in one room together and be singing this together, but this is a wonderful, wonderful hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful grace. I think that's actually face. That's a typo. Wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. How many of you want to say, Lord, uh, I want to look upon Jesus. Whatever my focus is, help it to be only upon you. And Lord, I want to ask that your grace be strange in my life. Strange. I want you to have a strange presence in my life. Be real. That's my continual prayer on an hourly and uh, a daily basis. And that's my prayer for all of you. Let us pray together, shall we? Gracious Father, Lord, we live in such a visual world. And Lord, even without all the visual stuff, there are so many selfish temptations out there. Lord, we ask that you empower all of us to lock our eyes upon Jesus. Not just more of our habits, not just more of our devotional time and, 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 and devo devotional uh, reading, but Lord, help us to see the character of Jesus, to touch our hearts with his grace. And Lord, help us to lock on and never let go. So that like Peter, 
as long as we have our eyes upon you, we can walk on water. Grant us the gift of beholding you, we pray for myself and for every brother and sister who can hear my voice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Justin Kim. Amen. Yes, yes. And a praise God for the wonderful message. I believe that all of us have been blessed. No, sorry, I think my voice echoing. Okay. All right, much better now. <laughs> and I pray that the Holy Spirit will work in us that we may behold Jesus every day and every hour of our of our life. To end, I would like to remind everyone that our next session, the Divine Service, will start at 11.30. And the speaker is Pastor Anil Kanda. He will be talking about the uncharted territory. So do join us again, and I wish you all a blessed Sabbath. This is why you should come to SALT. To study the Bible like you have never studied before. To build your character. To make lasting friendships. To transform your life. Give up a year for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Just look at the times that we're living in. God is searching for an army of young people to take the gospel to the whole world. Will you be part of that army today? Hi everyone. I'd like to invite you to our daily AOY United Prayer from 6.15 a.m. to 6.55 a.m. for the Chinese session and 7 a.m. to 7.40 a.m. for the English session at Malaysian time. We have come to serious times which calls for serious prayers. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. We acknowledge that we need the Holy Spirit, and this can be made a reality through united prayer. God will do things for us when we pray that He will not do if we do not pray, we must all learn the power of prayer. Great things will happen in and among God's people and throughout the world if His people will come unitedly to pray. In our daily united prayer, we will pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit together. So come and join us in our daily united prayer, the most sacred and blessed time of the day. See you there!